data breaches cost companies $3.8 million per breach on average. And that compromised employee accounts are the most expensive root cause of these breaches. Now, IBM just did an in-depth study on the cost of data breaches. And to explain further is Chris Scott. Uh, he is the Director of Security Innovation at IBM. So, Chris, great to have you here to explain in depth a little bit about what this report entails. And um, I guess kind of give me an overview of what you found out. I mean, we're seeing a lot of companies making drastic changes to their business models. People are doing Zoom calls uh, like we're doing and online banking and e-commerce more than ever before. So is that particularly lending itself to more data breaches? When we think about the data breaches, there's a lots of factors that come into play. Work from home is obviously one of those as we've increased that attack surface. The other thing that really impacts that cost of the data breach is time. Uh, the, that old adage of time is money still applies into this data breach world where you have to worry about how fast do you respond? What are you focused on? Have you conducted training? I kind of think of it as the firefighters of incident response. Mm. If we think about having a fire in the world, we want our firefighters trained and understanding how to respond to that process and not it being the first time that they try to fight a fire is the day that it shows up. And that's a huge impact on the time which reduces the cost. So training that team and working through the process early and then adding automation is the other big factor there. How do we add automation to the process to really reduce the time and have people focus on what matters? Okay, so explain to me how that automation works. Does that like kind of just look for irregularities in data and then we'll alert a human to that? Or how does that work exactly? So all that automation really focuses on is let's take that big amount of data and reduce it down to the data that the human cares to see so that we can focus on the things that, are, that really do matter. Again, reducing time is the big focus there. Right. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Now, it's customer personal data that seems to be mostly exposed in these huge data breaches that we've seen lately. Is that what you found in your studies? Yeah, and a lot of things when it comes to customer data, we can really measure kind of the financial impact when it comes to customer data. We know what legal fees are involved. You can see kind of the brand reputation process and really about how, what it takes to, to recover from that. But you also have to think about intellectual property, right? Intellectual property loss also happens to a business. That's much harder for us to calculate because that has a much longer tail. Is it going to impact, you know, competitive advantage? Is it going to impact the business's buy? bottom line. So think about those costs. You have to think about obviously the PII and SPI information, all of that personal information we gather about the consumer, but also protecting intellectual property. And you have okay. And you also looked at mega breaches. So first of all, what constitutes a mega breach and how damaging can those be? Yeah. So when we think about mega breaches, now we're talking about a really large set of records that are lost, right? We're talking about major amounts of information. And we think as we move to cloud, right, as more businesses move to the cloud process, as more businesses put more information into those online systems, we're bringing lots of information into a single locations. And so mega breaches are really like that impact into those areas. And as those record counts increase, that cost grows because you have more notifications, you have more legal fees that may apply. And so as we start to consolidate this information to grow businesses, we have to think about how do we secure that, which then gets into that whole conversation, misconfigured clouds. Have we make sure that we're doing proper authentication into our clouds and securing the communication between them because we're moving away from this world of like the castle and moat almost, right? We don't have a big moat surrounding an independent data center where one business is working. We're putting everything up into one location, into the cloud, and we have to think about new ways to secure that and making sure our people understand how to do it. Okay, and nation state attacks. It seems like we've been seeing more of these lately um, as kind of just international tensions are increasing. Um, how damaging are those? How do they differ from just somebody who wants to get somebody's credit card information? Yeah, when, when you think of nation state, right, you're talking about a person who is being sponsored by a government to break into an environment. And so they, they're a lot more stealth. And this is where I think intelligence has a big impact on how we approach the problem. They're focused on a different outcome than stealing personal information to make a quick dollar to what we might see from a financial crime aspect. They're really focused on the longer term. And because they're more stealth, we have to think about how do I see what they're doing? How do I understand the impact they're having? 
And then it gets right back into that whole training aspect, teaching the responders that you have a different style of threat and you have to respond in a different way so that we can shrink the time that you're exposed. Now, is automation as effective with a nation state attack versus a typical hack attack? When you think about the entire environment of a network, there's lots of data flowing through. So automation can actually reduce all of the information you have to look at and let you focus on the things that matter. It, it'll help in both cases. That's why we're a big proponent of security automation. Okay. And then, Chris, finally, what steps can a company take to prevent this? And then if there would be something to mitigate the damage as much as possible? Well, there are a few key things for me, especially when we consider the work from home aspect. You have to make sure you have visibility on your endpoints, understand what they're doing. They're no longer within the environment where you had, again, that task one moat thing we talked about. You don't have the edge to look at that process. You've now got to focus on what that endpoint is doing. And then the other thing, when we think credentials, credentials are such a big way into an environment how do we focus on the protection of those credentials, multi-factor authentication, biometrics, all of these things in essence make it harder for an attacker to break in and give our defenders a quicker time to respond. Okay. And why don't we use more biometrics just on a personal level? <laughs> Seems like that would be a solution. <laughs> Is there something right. that's holding that up or... Well, you know, as we think about biometrics, first, you have to make sure people are comfortable with fingerprints and facial recognition storage. And I think that the vendors have gotten to a really good balance there. Also, it's a lot more technology and technology driven. So we're starting to see, you know, processors are in a good place, cameras are in a good place. So we're getting much more comfortable with biometrics. Okay. Um, and I think that you'll see that continue to grow as we go forward. Okay, very interesting. Chris, thanks so much for coming and sharing uh, the results of this IBM study. It's something I think we're going to be talking about for a long time in the future. So. Thanks, Jane. Have a good day. Thank you.